Thank you. Um, so welcome again. No, I'm not going to. You've already been here. I'm the one who's come <laughs> back. Um, so this session, we're going to talk about the different opportunities that exist within the higher education space. Um, and with me, two esteemed colleagues from that industry who will, will introduce themselves in, in, in a moment. The competitive scene in, in universities has already always been there through, through the Newell and latterly the NSE. Academically, there are more and more degree courses are now being developed, um, starting off even just a couple of years ago when there really weren't that many opportunities. Um, it's just worth saying in the US now, there are over 200 colleges offering scholarships for esports in the same way they do for traditional sports. But even in the US, there isn't necessarily the academic programs yet around esports in the, in the higher education space. So I would love to, we'll explore that my two colleagues here will explain the situation, what they're involved with here in the UK, and how they are shaping the way um, for, for, for this in, in the UK and hopefully around the world. So I'm going to ask you to introduce yourselves, introduce your institution um, and your role, and then beyond that we'll dive deeper into what your institutions are actually doing. Thanks, thanks very much, Tom. So my name is Andy Meir, and I'm a professor at Salford University, where we've been working in esports for, wow, it feels like it's a very long time, but I think we had our first esports event in 2016. Chester came up, and we were talking about the industry, but I suppose it does go back further for us, and I think for many people in the sector, because it begins with the gaming programs that we develop. So... At this stage, we've had uh, esports being taught across the university. One of the reasons that I'm really excited about it, and I teach in a school of science, engineering, and environment, where we have people working on all sorts of immersive technologies, and where we collaborate with people in business, health, and in the art school around our esports program. So over this decade almost now, we've had a huge amount of probably unparalleled co collaboration across the university, not just in terms of thinking about curriculum and what we might teach the students, but I would say particularly supporting those emerging esports students that are coming through the system and calling for these sorts of courses. But we've also prioritised a lot the research activity around it as well. So often as academics we sort of think about what are those emerging research areas and esports became really a big thing, I guess, around sort of 2017, 18. And so I personally have been working particularly with the industry um, on the board of British Esports, but also a commission member for Global Esports Federation to try to grow that industry around the practice and then provide the pipeline of students that come into the space. So it's a great time now for us, I think, particularly in, in Media City and Salford, where we have a critical mass of people that are developing not just experiences in new games, which is a big part of what we do at Salford, but also those other skills that are required to help people enter the industry, whether it's in management business or, or even the science of it as well. And that, I think, is where universities are really exciting places because you have... Bio, bio, biologists, you have anatomists, you have all sorts of people from different industries entering this environment, and it's incredibly collaborative, and that's what we're doing at Salford. Wow, that's wonderful. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name's Philip Wilson. I'm the chair and one of the founders of the College of Esports, which is a dr dramatically, I will say, it's the, the world's first dedicated university-level institution at 100% for, uh, for esports. We're based at the Velodrome uh, at the Olympic Parks. So we've got a very, very um, sort of contemporary type of uh, camp uh, campus feel. And we're starting with our first cohort in September um, this year. Um, it's taken us about five years to get to where we are now because clearly you can't open up a corner shop and say we're now providing university degree level education. I also sit on the board of the Quality Assurance Agency, so I'm sort of slightly poacher and gamekeeper uh, in, in that regard. So we're starting off with a small suite of programmes, around five, international esports business, but then also with a flavour of digital marketing, digital media, events, uh, and also um, management and coaching. Um, we look at the esports and gaming world as a global supply chain. Um, we don't look at it particularly from the front-end gaming point of view. Um, so from that point, you know, people like Confetti and the amazing facilities here today, they're very much in one part of the uh, higher education, but we're more on the sort of the business, uh, business and management side. Uh, we're very fortunate to have an exclusive partnership with the British Esports Association, which we're very humbled, but with that comes a big responsibility for us to make sure that we sort of carry that burden uh, appropriately. Uh, as well. Um, we teach around a model called the tri-curriculum. Um, you know, we look at the degree certificate purely as the entry ticket to the job market. That won't get you a job. 
all the other things that students have when they leave will get them a job. So we, our contact time is around 20 hours a week. And what we do is we work on their exit plan from the first day they walk in through the front door. So we have this world ready kind of curriculum, which is about you know three years of work experience, uh, a whole raft of different areas looking at mental and emotional resilience. And right in the center, it's all about mi mindfulness and well-being. You know, my, my experience as, bit as a, having t tens of thousands of students under my stewardship over the years is literally that the things that derail students are not the academic bit. You know, if students have got a brain and, they've got, um, and we've got good staff, that'll take care, that journey will go down its natural course. It's the things that keep them looking at the bedroom ceiling at three o'clock in the morning. So yoga, Pilates, meditation, them to understand, be self-aware of how they can decompress and give them the tools to be able to do that. That's really, really important, and for our staff as well. So very, very different boutique of style, uh, you know, small class sizes around about 15. Uh, and we are looking to, we're starting in London, but we've already got discussions for another number of campus locations around the country and internationally uh, as well. So we're very ambitious, but obviously our meat and potatoes at the moment is in, is in London. So w do you want to tell us a little, because obviously colleagues in this room who have got students who are going to be moving through to mm -hmm. potentially I into your establishment, Philip, do you want to explain what are the entry requirements? What advice maybe could you pass on to some colleagues in the audience here today? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Tom. It's a good question. I think that from a, from a UCAS point, it's about 96, which people might say, well, that's a bit low. It's a bit lower than, than some. But for us, it's not death by UCAS points. Yes, UCAS is a, an important system. But, you know, if you've been on the planet for 18 years, judging a young person by, you know, if they do A-levels, three A-levels, it's six exams, 12, hour, 12 hours of their life, or two years of having a BTEC, we look at the individual holistically. You know, because esports and gaming, it's a cultural phenomenon. So we're looking for people who sort of actually will, will fit in that. So what we look for really is the personal statement that we drill down into. And, and we also do one-to-one -one with each of the potential students and also their families as well. And what we're looking for is passion, drive, the ability for them to really put the shoulder to the wheel. I think that if they've got enthusiasm and a brain and passion, then we can we can do the rest. But we do get involved with parents. And I know around GDPR and we have to sign forms, etc. but you know, a lot of students, certainly through the BTECs and the R applicants initially, they're the first people to go to university in their, mm. in their family tree. And that actually, I think, is, is an additional responsibility <laughs> for us as a higher education provider. So we understand the students at the sharp end handing the work in, but actually around that, there's a whole support structure, you know, making that happen. So it's about, um, I think, making the whole family as a unit feeling, uh, feeling comfortable. Uh, you know, we're not right for everybody. You know, small class sizes, we expect basically 100% attendance, 20 hours a week. We'll work the students hard, but that's bi-directional. We want them to be demanding of ourselves. So, you know, if they want a room of 200 and sit at the back in the traditional environment, it's definitely not for us. Um, but we're very, very focused on the individual. I mean, I think that's such an important message, and certainly at Salford, we've got an HND that was due to launch next year with the BSc top up later on. And a lot of the people, I think, in the industry are very aware that what esports brings in terms of educational pathways is a route that for many people there is no other. And actually, focusing on those demographics that perhaps aren't too clear whether they see a way into higher education has been a real priority for us, working with the local community and other agencies around us to help provide some way into HE is a big part of what we're trying to do. Yeah, absolutely. And that sort of links into sort of a question here is for you, for you Andy, it's, it's sort of, there's a range of these courses exist now linked to esports. W why is that the case? Why it's not one size fits all, is it? It really isn't. And I sort of think back to where I began, which was in sports science at a time when it was already very established and where you had multiple different degree titles for different areas of interest. And esports, I think, is at that moment of, of becoming this remarkably expansive area where there are a huge range of specialisms in it and whether you're business management, working on the science side of things, health. I mean, you know, so much around digital health is looking to gaming and esports as a way of trying to bring these areas of innovation together. And I think it's because of those different skill sets that each requires and the expansion of that, particularly through the professionalization of esports as well. You know, we have more players that are working at an elite level where you need that entourage of scientific expertise to get the best out of the performance. So it's wonderful because it feels like people can find their home. We're not quite 
there yet. We have still only a limited number of degrees in the UK, but as you mentioned, Tom, that's right, we're doing pretty well and it's growing. And I'd also say that it's worth sort of thinking about for those people that aren't too clear where they want to go, seeing where esports exists in multiple degrees. So it's not just the esports degrees that are providing it. There are modules and other degrees where you can see that sort of activity and it might then lead into a master's qualification that's focused on esports. But those are quite appealing routes for some people. Yeah, absolutely. So, Philip, what about then the career pathways from this? Um, you know, the, the links on to then beyond the College of Esports and how you're preparing students for that type of thing. Yeah, thanks, Tom. I mean, I think that our, our degrees, but nature by most, um, most esports degrees are transferable. And I think young people will have a portfolio career during their career. Um, so I think that it's not just about getting students into their sort of first job when they're 21, 22. It's about allowing them to change horses when they're 30 and be building a real resilience into their program. Um, what, what I in, did actually, um, as far as sort of, you know, what future proofing, I looked at the, the uh, World Economic Forum, you know, their list of skills, you know, what they're, what they're actually looking at. And I'll, if you can I'll take the liberty of reading that sort of the top 10 out. And for me, these all resonate with esports generally. So analytical, uh, analytical thinking and innovation, active learning and learning strategies, complex pro problem solving, critical thinking and analysis, creativity, originality and initiative, leadership and social influence, technology use, monitoring and control, technology design and programming, resilience, stress tolerance and flexibility, and reasoning, problem solving and ideation. And I think that, you know, that you could pr pretty much map that to most to most esports e programs. So, you know, we're, I think that esports provides students with um, a real window into multiple different types of careers because, you know, esports and gaming, it, it is a global supply chain industry. It's not just about the front end, it's media marketing, finance, logistics. It's just pretty much every business sector in the world has a, a relationship in some way, shape, or form from an operational perspective with, uh, with gaming. Um, so, I think that it's absolutely, you know, one of the careers for the future. Um, you know, my first degree was in geography, you know, back in about 1855. And, um, you know, I've never used it. It's just a test of the ability to process and reprocess information. So, you know, esports is the way of harnessing a student's passion for something, taking the time they spend on that and using that as a driving force, as an engine under their ribcage to get a degree, but go and get into a career that they really enjoy. I think it's an amazing industry. Go on, Eddie. I mean, I'd agree completely. And I would say also what's really exciting is that we, we now have research that demonstrates that those things are coming through the esports pipeline. And for me, it's it's often actually, as you sort of mentioned earlier, it's not just the curriculum, it's what happens in the institution around that passion. So the fact that you have students from across the schools working together to produce events, working with getting sponsorship for things, it's all those sorts of things that happen in the culture of esports in, in the university sector that I think is where you get that unique network that comes out of the the practice. But it's uh, a lot of our work, I think, is actually just getting that across to people because it's, it's still a, a job to explain these things to people that in fact esports is a route into all these different skill developments. I think if I may you use the term unique, I think it is a unique environment mm. because it really does cut across all race, religion, sexual orientation, gender and gender identity and I think that because of that sort of melting pot of different types of people and the global ecosystem which it, inco which it uh, sort of um, uh, is housed in, I think that it really can show and, and demonstrate tolerance and understanding of all different cultures. I think that's a real kernel and strength of the industry. Great, thank you. Um, one to Andy here. Um, the delivery model of degree programs and the sort of the, how they've changed or how they've evolved through lockdown, how do you see things like the metaverse? How do you think the delivery model of courses is gonna change and evolve moving forward? Well, I think one of the things we, we've heard already, but also have learned over the last few years, um, not just in, in esports programs, but actually in the university sector more widely, is how much of the degree is in fact industry connected. So where you are receiving credits for working within the industry during your degree is a big shift, certainly. We see lots of students that are stepping out of that curriculum. We have many sort of black box modules where people then can invest into a program or project, a live brief that allows them to perhaps deliver an esports event as part of their own personal curriculum development. And I think that's, um, it resonates, I think, a lot with the students and what they want out of the university education as well. So those forms of delivery, I think, are really crucial. I think what's also 
interesting is that um, obviously we often talk about sort of routes from college into undergraduate, but actually at the postgraduate level, there's also a lot more that's, that's innovative and, and interesting that's happening in that sector. So we're beginning to see PhD students that now are in universities doing their projects entirely on esports, which is having such an impact on the culture of, of, of learning in the institutions as well. So, and often those are very much uh, people coming to do a PhD from industry. So those connections, I think, are paramount. Uh, and I think if there's one thing I've sort of heard over the last few years with a lot of the curriculum development is that that has to be core to everything. And part of the reason for that, it does go a bit to the sort of metaverse conversations. Yesterday, we had the Web3 Summit in London where lots of companies were trying to figure out their way into this. It's such a fast moving world that actually those skills that you read out, as opposed to knowing how to do one thing, are where you need to be. So you need to have graduates that have the capacity to be agile, to evolve into new forms of, of, of technology and bring that into their work streams. And, and without that agility, it's really hard to be actually ready for work in a, in a long-term sense. Yeah, I think also as well as that, because the esports world is such a fluid and ever-changing environment, you know, my generation, you know, change is seen as a threat, but the, the young generation, it, their life is just constantly fluid. And I think that being taught in that kind of context where, you know, the fluidity and, and change is actually an opportunity, I think, and then linked to the mental resilience that they need and to be able to adopt in that kind of environment, I think it's a real, really good training platform for, for future life. Excellent. And this sort of links on to one of my final questions, really, is, Philip, you, you mentioned about, obviously, the College of Esports is, is a boutique environment, is a boutique institution. Small class size is not, your, you know, stereotypical 200 people in a lecture theatre. Is that a model you see working, moving forward, more and more in the HE sector, more boutique specialist um, centres like the College of Esports? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question, Tom. I think that, you know, historically, actually, a lot of institutions started off like that, and certainly in the arts, music, the conservatoire type of model, you know, that's that's been very, very strong for, for, for many centuries. I think that the, the Higher Education Research Act here at 2017, um, uh, that uh, was a major shift in 25 years as far as um, how the government, the DfE, uh, Department of Education, sorry, and the um, now the Office for Students actually look at um, higher education, so we're seeing not just in esports, people like Dyson Institute as well, people, organisations, and now the acceptance by industry and by students that if they want to go and do something particular, they need to go to a special institution rather than some, an institution that does, you know, pretty much everything. Um, uh, I think also as well as that we're seeing, you know, FE colleges in their local areas, you know, that that following the trends really of students wanting to stay more in their local area and obviously with economic pressures I think we're going to see that that curve maybe ste steepen slightly so FE colleges getting more involved in foundation degrees we're working helping colleges and happy to chat um, through pe people later that's a plug um, <laughs> you know so we're working with sports leaders on a on a level a, sort of a level three leadership program that they'll put into colleges for like 16 UCAS points to give students a, a real taste mm. on, on top of the BTEC so there's there's lots going on. I mean, just to add to that, I think there's a really interesting conversation around campus in universities at the moment. Certainly at Salford, it's, it's a very live conversation. I spoke to many vice chancellors in the last year or so where coming out of COVID, they're not sure that the big lecture model is in fact one we either should or would want to sustain and that there is a demand for something very different, a demand for perhaps making your time on campus an event rather than something you have to do or come along to a lecture. Those sorts of transformations are, are happening and I think what appeals for institutions perhaps like here is building a venue that people want to go to be with each other, to explore exciting things, is a bigger part of what I think the university campus is becoming, which is why we have a thing called the Makerspace on our, on our campus in, in Salford, where people can come and try out a whole range of technologies and, and create stuff. And, and that aspect of creativity, I think, is becoming a bigger part of that learning experience. But Andy, do you not think that's so, sort of already happened? I mean, you know, my own experience, you know, doing my MBA you know, at Liverpool Management School, you know, we were in our own building, there's 30,000 students rattling around the campus, but you stay within your know, ecosystem mm. are you finding that within say Salford as far as that your birds of feather your students are staying within the same environment 
They do typically, yeah. but in addition to that, there was a, a big report published in around Greater Manchester last year, which just revealed, in fact, we as a campus are not open to the wider public, and we really want to change that. It yeah. wasn't just us, but other campuses generally yeah. aren't populated by many other people other than students. And mm. so rethinking our place in the community and our contribution to that community, so getting more school kids into the campus, seeing what we do, is a big part of that trajectory. And that's why a lot of the events we're working on are in fact bringing schools and colleges into our campus to do esports activity. Um, partly because we have the technology that can facilitate that, but also it's about creating a really exciting space. My son is in his first year at secondary school, and this year his teacher set up their first esports team, a Rocket League team, and uh, they made it to uh, the Digital Schoolhouse finals and went down to Gfinity for the big event. And, you know, that's a remarkably memorable experience for them. And I think that, for me, is sort of where it is. And, and each teacher, many of whom haven't got a clue about esports, they're trying to figure it out because their kids are demanding it, yeah. are becoming the ambassadors for this world, which is incredibly exciting, but really radical, I would say, as well. Cool. Right, last questions. Um, I appreciate we're running over a little bit for, for lunch. Um, it's a question to both of you, to each for you to take individually. And a little bit of a controversial one maybe to finish off with is what would you say to people who say you don't need a degree to work in the esports industry? Because that's, that unfortunately is a, is a classic one that we've had over the last three or four years. So is there a short sort of statement or so, so a short answer to that from each of you? How, how polite do you want me to be to answer that question? <laughs> uh, I mean, I think that if you if you look at other traditional sports, they've taken 150 years really to mature. And even you know before the Premier League, football was generally a cottage industry. Um, and I think now it's grown into sort of a professional business. I think that esports is uh, the, with the degrees coming through, we can break, put into the industry people who are properly qualified, who understand about business and, and, the, and, the, and the environment, also understand the isms of, um, of the gaming industry. I think that you need to keep the trailblazer and entrepreneurial and the, if you like, the mavericks, because that's a real driver in the industry, but you do need structure to give it some sustainability. It can't be all about you know, fireworks. You have to have some, some foundations and bringing in um, best practices from other industries. You know, like you know, we we've got a module on you know intellectual property and media rights. You know, so looking at how you know the Netflix and people like that, the music industry have done it for decades. If you can't lock down your content in your IP, then you know, so let's so the industry can learn from other industries, but it has to be open to be able to do that. Most of the people I work with have had very diverse careers come into learning in different points of their life. So I would say that, in fact, I would agree with that. You don't need to have an esports degree to get into the industry, but it can help. And it can be an interesting way to develop a rounded perspective on the world, which I think is what universities should be about. Be very, very focused on making sure that you're employable at the end of university, but actually it should be a space in which your mind expands beyond the things that day-to-day -day jobs require. And actually, I think that's what we need to get to those skills that you talked about. Yeah. And that's hopefully what universities can provide. And Andy, you mentioned about level seven postgrad. Mm. I, mean, I mean, again, I'm sure you're looking at it like we are, like probably most people, is that um, are you seeing that then as a, not just for, so a degree gets people actually into the industry when they're young, but are you seeing the level seven postgrad as being a transformative qualification for me? If you're an FD in a particular sector, you can go and do a postgrad in, in esports and gaming, and then you can segue into the industry, which obviously is good for that individual, but good for the industry because they bring in people with knowledge with that background. Yeah, I mean, I, w I would. I would say, just you know, personally speaking, I, I tell all of my students to do a post-grad because I think I benefited from having that. When At the end of my undergraduate, I wasn't ready for a job. I wasn't ready for the workplace. I still didn't know what I was going to do. So that something about that master's level work gives you the space, I think, to figure out after having accrued all that expertise. And of course, we can't expect everyone to do that. But I think if you can put yourself in a situation where you can have opportunities to reflect on what you're doing and where you want to go, then that's, that's the way to do it. And I think that <coughs> that's the thing. It's, it's about continual learning, isn't it? It's about it is, developing absolutely. continual learners and <coughs> engendering continuing professional development throughout our careers. And I'll, I'll, I'll finish it just by saying that even the wisest minds have something yet to learn. And on that note, I will say thank you to two wise minds <laughs> and uh, let everybody go for their lunch. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Andy. <laughs> Thanks, Tom.